going through some challenges, but. <laughs> so here we go. Om Sadashiva Samarambam Shankarasharya Madhyamam Asmadasharya Pariyantam Vande Guru Param Param Ishwaro Guratmeti Murti Veda Vibhagine Yom Abda Vyapta Dehaya Dakshna Murtaye Namaha Sava Vedanta Sedanta Gocharam tama gocharam, govindam paramanandam, sat guru pranatosh maham mo. Om shanti 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 om, here comes Mark, and we are good to go. So we have a, <clears throat> we have a good, a good sangha today. So what shall we do? I don't recall having received any questions. Let me see if anything came last moment, but uh, I don't. Did, did any, uh, any of you send me a question last moment? No, no? I, I commented on YouTube. I just said that, um, you know, it, it all sounds, all the divisions, it sounds so mathematical and I like that. You know, it's like, um, it's, uh, it's so logical. All of it. Yeah, it is brilliant. It is scientific, and it is very nicely supported by by logic. You know the way Ishwara unfolds. You know the three energies into the subtle elements, and then keeping doing this miracle of of creation. You know, oh, Mark, why Mark is still not in? So it's beautiful. Yeah, I love these teachings. Yeah. So I, I rarely go on YouTube to see questions or commentaries. And uh, whenever you, you write question, commentary there, send me a short message so that okay. I can go there and, and see it. Okay. That was my only comment is it sounds mathematical. Like you could put it into a formula. I mean, yeah. it would be a com complex formula, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, mathematicians do that all the time. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, Mark is having a hard time to come in. I don't know where he is. We have two options here. If we either do some QA or we go back to the big picture as we have agreed upon. So, I'm trying to wait for Mark. Let's see what Claudio. Uh, yes, I have a hard time with my webcam. I don't know why it doesn't work. I try. Well, you don't need to show up. I just need to know you are with us, and if you if you have any question. Yeah, yeah, I'm here, and um, I not really question, but uh, yes, like Ruth, I say it's very interesting what we are. Uh, um, the Panchadasi now all this uh, technical stuff I like it and uh, for at the moment no question because it's clear but uh, it would be nice if we go on talking about that maybe I don't know revising something or, or also the big picture is okay everything for me but uh, it's I want to say that I also see again the, the Monday's uh, lesson and it was uh, very, very interesting. And uh, when I hear it again, I understand it always in a new level because maybe like I'm always be, tam I, I'm always tamasic on even, but uh, it's, it's very beautiful, very beautiful. I like it. Maybe it's not necessary because I heard Ramji say that maybe it's not essential for, uh, for, um, for understanding, for self-knowledge, maybe all this technical stuff. But for me, it's like uh, essential. Well, uh, it's, uh, this, nice. several of these teachings, they are not essential for self-knowledge, but they are essential for the development of, uh, of uh, respect to the scripture or, or trust in the scripture, you know? When you see the beauty and, and how beautifully, you know, supported by by science, by logic, you know, 
and then one develops more respect or value or, or, or trust, confidence in the scripture as a valid means of self-knowledge, you know? So it, it, it has its value as well in the development of, uh, of, of shraddha, yeah? confidence in the scripture. Yeah, yeah, this is what I feel, exactly. It's, it's making me more confident, it makes me more clear. It, everything takes like a, a new, a, a more clear perspective. So for me, it's very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, having said so, let me turn this one off, airplane may, more. Uh, shall we go into the big picture, Mark, or you would like to add something to the Panchadas? Oh. Uh, now we can go into the big picture, but okay. just like Claudio said, I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying the Panchadasi too. I love okay. all this technical stuff as well. Okay. It makes so, my head work. And, uh, you know, yeah, let, me tell you, let, let me tell you one thing. The Panchadas is a beautiful, well-organized text, and it is very extensive. It's going to take us a year or more to cover it all. If the, the group, I mean, the only downside of saying, like, we're going to do Pancha does in Mondays and Thursdays is that some people who can only do Mondays, they are going to be behind, but they can always go and watch the video. You understand? So we can we can propose that we can tell like, oh, I mean, we got together this Thursday and everybody was really into Pancha does. And how about, uh, and we have decided more or less, you know, the majority here wins, so we are at six. And then we say, so we have decided that we do Panchadas on Mondays and Thursdays. And whosoever cannot come to one of the two have access to the videos. So this is another option. What do you guys find of, it, of this option, of this idea? Yeah, I, I, I like that idea, Alindo, because to be honest, I really like the hour and a half format on Mondays. But, you know, obviously, if people don't like that, then um, then too bad. So if we can continue and do it on Thursdays as well, fantastic. I, I, I agree that I think two one hour sessions would be good. Um, an hour and a half for me uh, was like just an overload of my brain. Like I kind of find myself checking out because especially with the detail, um, I would like to move a little faster through Panchadasi. And so it would be nice to do it on Mondays and Thursdays. Okay, so uh, and, and you have a point Ruth, because uh, uh, the tradition, the tradition usually presents the teachings in one hour session because overdose, sometimes uh, it's a bit too much, you know? So all traditional teachers, they present the class in one hour format. So if we do one hour on Monday and Thursday, I think we could move along faster. It's still going through the details, you know, but moving faster. So the question now is, uh, Claudio, Karen, and Lynn, shall we drop the Yana Yoga from next week on and doing Panchadas both days or not? Yeah, why not? For me, would it's we okay. lose um, would we lose Dave and Gert for half of the text? That's a. I would hate to have that. No, be the uh, outcome. Uh, uh, Gert and Dave. Or are you just talking Q and A? The dirt, Gert and 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 Dave. They they wouldn't. Uh, they they can't come. They they at least for the moment. Gert definitely he cannot do this this class due to the timing, but Dave he's overloaded with several issues and he needs more time for his personal things. Okay, so but they have access they have access to the video to catch up. You think that would cut them off? Is that what you're suggesting, Lynn? No, I would just miss them. <laughs> That's all. No, they are. You see, they are not here on Thursdays. Gert was never here on Thursday, and Dave has, has told me that he definitely would prefer to do it once a week. But I mean, the thing is whether they would feel like, oh, they are going to move faster and, uh, you know, and then now I have to watch the video, but I don't want to watch the video. I don't know if they, if they would feel like, you know, as if we are kind of cutting them off a little bit, you know? We are making- We, we can ask next, 
next Monday, we can ask them if they are comfortable with this idea. Okay, good idea. Maybe. Let's do that. Yeah. We, we can also ask, no? Yeah. And we see. But I think, Arlindo, that the, the Thursday can, in a certain way, remain more, uh, uh, how we can say, more, uh, uh, we, we can also have more more questions, more Q&A. We, we will see what happens, you know, we can stop for the moment the big picture and go on only with Panchadasi, but the Thursday remains more open to Q&A, we can say that. Okay. What yeah. do you think? Yeah, it's okay. I mean, I, I, we, we open today, you know, first for Q&As. If there are no Q, Q questions, there are no A's. And then we move in, into the big picture. So that's the that's the the rule here, right? So because well, we... I, I, <clears throat> I was gonna say I I like the big picture, but I I feel like two books at once feels a little overwhelming for me. But maybe we just come back to the big picture. I mean, even if it's a year down the road, right? Yeah. How do people feel about that? Or yeah. we just finish it on our own. I, I've i actually well, read it once quite a while back and I've forgotten. <laughs> the big picture is, is a simple, uh, well-structured introductory text, you know? And it does not hurt to revisit those those principles, but it's, it's a little bit funny when we are dealing with more deep, profound stuff to go back mm, and yeah. and explain again what is bhakti, what is yana, what is the purpose, the role mm. of the student. And, you know, it's a bit funny because, you know, we are doing very advanced texts and then we step back to deal with introductory things, you know. I, I, I hear that as well. So what shall we do today? Uh, I maybe have a little question that I had on Monday, uh, that comes to me on Monday, because we talk about the, the fact that uh, the, um, the body is inert, to say we still talk about all the elements, you know. But um, in a certain way, there is uh, this, you know, this, uh, in the new age, in the, mark, in the spiritual market there, a lot of people say, ah, the body has his own intelligence. Uh, the body is very intelligent, you know, maybe you heard about that. Yeah. And in Vedanta, we say that it's totally inert. It's only flesh and bones, uh, nothing. Uh, but uh, what there is, a, of course, there is a, a certain intelligence that we can see because the body heals itself, you know, these things and... But, but this intelligence, we can say that is the pranas, right? That are in the body. Can we say that? Well, uh, the, the body, to begin with, there is a confusion there between the, the very, very intelligently designed universe that is sustained mm. by this intelligence, which is the, the, the primary cause of the universe, which is the intelligent no cause of the universe, which is such of a knowledge, intelligence. So just the body is likewise designed intelligence, intelligently and to be to be kept, you know, to process karma. So this body is intelligently designed, meaning to say it has its own intelligence, but the intelligence does not really belong to the body, as you point you're pointing out. It belongs to to all the systems, you know, digestion, respiratory, and uh, you know, and all the five physiological systems, and it is operated by a very intelligent vital air. So, why the vital air is often confused as the self, because it is the vital air that animates and keeps the body alive. Once the vital air moves away, you understand and then it no longer survives. You know, the body begins its process of decomposition. But the, but the vital air alone is not responsible for the intelligence of the body, you know? We have the exactly. subtle body because the subtle body in, is in which, you know, that is the which is the, the, the second body, is the main body that's going to operate, is going to permeate the physical body and operate. There are several things there that allows the body to be 
alive besides the vital, the pranas. The pranas is a very dynamic element, but then we have the sense organs, you know, that are going to, to, to make this machinery called the, the body-mind complex to operate. And then we have the intellect, the individual intellect making their decisions as well. It's an interaction between what Ishwara provides us with, which is the, the pranas, the organs, and then the mind, the, the filler, now, the, the mind, the integrator, and then the intellect and the you. So all these elements, these different functions of the of the subtle body keeps this body alive. Yeah? So we have these other functions before, besides the pranas, because the, the pranas, yeah? this physiological system, because we were given free will, the power to determine, decide, and so on. And then there are other aspects to our subtle body, which is not only the, 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 the automatic mechanic, you know system of uh, <coughs> that uh, that Ishwara runs runs for us you know the, the five physiological systems so there are two different things one is the intelligence of the body which is the intelligence of Ishwara okay Ishwara is intelligent it somehow it brought the element air and then added some rajas to it and then gave it some sativa with the intelligence necessary to run this machinery. The five systems are energies, they are air that they are going to be, you know, doing its, its purpose, its, its roles in, in, in running this machine, keeping this machine in balance, you know, and so on. And meanwhile, there are other laws, the laws of, uh, of uh, temporality, let's say, you know, that uh, the body is going to age and then it's going to have more and more difficult to, to, to be operated, you know, because everything that's born must go as we know. So there is, there is the intelligence that was the Satva Guna that Ishwara mixed with Rajas and then the intelligence of Satva with the, the energy of Rajas, you know, create this beautiful intelligent design air that exercise five different functions you understand in, in our in our body mind complex it's beautiful okay so the whole body mind complex is intelligent designed but it is designed by ishwara but ishwara gave the the jivas but just to go to conclude this one but this these pranas and this body mind, this body, let's say, we are talking about the intelligence of the body, this body and even the pranas, they are not sentient factors or beings or, or principle, meaning you should say they are not aware of their environment and they don't choose how to move about doing what they do. They are they are operated by Ishwara, you understand? And they don't perceive the environment. A sentient, a sentient being is someone who perceives its environment and an intelligent sentient being is someone who perceives its environment and responds to the stimulus from the standpoint of, self, of, of a free will, the power, the intelligent power to, to decide how to go about responding to the stimulus coming from, from the field. So this body is not, is not really, you know, sentient, okay? As we know, Jiva Achama is a sentient being, okay? Intelligent, sentient being. But the body, the body itself, the body mind there is inert matter, but it is intelligent designed and intelligently operate by Shwara. So now when Shwara gives us the, the intelligence we have, and then we get in trouble because we would rather leave it all to Ishwara. Because when we see, we begin doing things that hurt the body mind complex, you know? Why? Because our vasana load. So how many of us know that, you know, eating a lot of sugar uh, hurts the body mind complex, you know? But yet, you know, we have, we have some habits that that prevents us from from doing what we know that is the best for the body mind so likewise we have our, our vasana expressing us to do things on different levels 
that somehow do not promote, do, do, does not, do not keep the, the, the balance, you know, the harmony of this body-mind complex. So for people who like to look into medicine as, as, a, as a holistic thing, you know, everybody knows that the body decays, disease settles in and so on, but generally speaking, so the body knows how to, to somehow to find its own balance and to, to revigorate itself, you know, to, to, <clears throat> to, to keep itself, you know. Uh, I mean, you know, if you cut, the skin grows again. Everything is, if we provide the body with the environment in which it can find its equilibrium again, it usually try to do it unless it's too old. Yeah? But, but we have this body, you know, that can do that, provided we stop doing those actions that have brought the unbalance and the illness to the body to begin with. So, you know, I mean, uh, when I started looking into how to keep the body alive, when I moved to the USA and I got in contact with a very good naturopathic, real doctor, but specialized in, in naturopathy. And uh, he says, oh, so if you, if you eat well, if you take some supplements, and if you stop doing the things that are causing the, the disease here, you know, the body is intelligent enough to find its balance. And what I had, I had a stressful lifestyle with a restaurant that was killing me. And my doctor would say, you have to give up this restaurant because you are never going to heal living under such terrible stress and drinking wine. You understand? Too much wine. So, you know, the intelligence of the body is there, but the body is no longer being operated by Ishwara alone. Ishwara, you know, has the knowledge to, the intelligence to operate is to perfect. Now the body is not only operated by Ishwara's intelligence, but is operated by our vasanas. And our vasanas, a lot of the time, is going to offset the intelligence of the body, you know? So we, one thing is material, energy, inert, inert. It's not, the body is not aware of us, you understand? So the pranas is not aware of us. They are not sentient beings, but they are intelligent design mm -hmm. operated by Ishwara, but then comes the Jiva and with one's Vasanas, we somehow, we make things difficult for Ishwara. And this is part of our, our uh, karmic no? uh, work here, you know, connecting the dots between our attitudes, thoughts and actions and the results, you know? If we get sick, if people who are obese, you know, they are big and big and big, and it's so clear that they are sick because they, they eat two, three, four times more than they need it. Huh? But <clears throat> yet the doctors say that and so on, and the person has a hard time, you know, due to the power of these, you know, these vasanas, these addictions, you know, tendencies, attitudes, and, and unhappinesses, and so on. So there is no contradiction between those two statements. The body is intelligent design. And it's designed by Ishwara and, and it is governed and run by Ishwara, but the Jiva has its free will, develops vasanas, and then makes it a little bit more difficult for this body to find its balance, its equilibrium again and again, even going through the process of aging, you know. Give me a moment, I forgot to bring my glass of my glass of water. Anything else, Claudio? Did it cover it? No, no, it's very clear. Thank you. Very clear. It was uh, essentially a simple question, but uh, uh, it helps me to, to to clarify a little bit. No, it's, a, it's, it's a not good only question. the pranas, of course, are more elements, but uh, yeah, uh, it was a good it's good question. also to understand. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you always hear these things uh, here and there. Oh, the body is intelligent. And you have to clarify what uh, means Vedanta when it says the body is only, it's only linear. So having yeah. clear that's... Uh, and, a, and a clear understanding that uh, of the fact that the body is, is, has its own intelligence because it was designed and it's run by this intelligence. It does not make the body uh, sentient. It's still inert matter mm -hmm. being operated by, by Ishwara, you understand? Mm -hmm. So what is then the sentience that we, we experience as a Jiva? What is that sentience? That, and this is a question for you, Claudio. It's consciousness. Yeah. Reflected on, on the subtle body, mm -hmm. then enlivens the... Yeah, so that 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 uh, resolves your question further, you know, because uh, the sentience that we we see in the body does not belong to to the body; it belongs to consciousness, awareness, Brahman. You understand? As it shines and reflects, so and then the jiva itself it will depend if it the jiva is identified with the three bodies or the two bodies, you no, know, the mind and and the physical body. It's going, it's going to, to take that the body and the mind are sentient, which is not right, you understand? So the body mind is not sentient. The jiva is not sentient as, as a configuration of the three bodies, you understand? So what is sentient? Is the atma, the atma of the jiva atma. That's why in the scripts present this term, jiva atma. Equal, Aikya, Paramatyama, is the Atyama, is the reflected consciousness, you understand, which fundamentally is consciousness, is what is sentient. So the importance to understand what the Jiva, in which way the Jiva can claim its freedom is as the self, as the Atyama, as the reflected consciousness once it understands that its nature, its true nature is original consciousness, you understand? <clears throat> it all depends on, on our identification. It's all a question of identity. If we identify with the body-mind, we identify with our inferior nature, which is inert matter slash energy. And it's bound to, to disappear in time. Huh? And it's limited in all possible mean, means. So it's all a question of identification and understanding that uh, the jiva will never be free. The jiva will never experience and claim its limitlessness. But the self, the atma, the reflect consciousness is what can claim its, its freedom as atma. You understand? And for that, we need to go through so much exercise to, to differentiate reflected consciousness from the reflecting medium. You understand? The reflecting medium. Reflecting medium is the body-mind complex, let's say, is the subtle body associated with the physical body. So we need to keep doing all these discriminations until we understand that reflected consciousness is not the body-mind complex, it's not the reflecting medium, but it is, in truth, original consciousness. Right? Very simple. Once we see it clearly, we have no more doubt. Yeah. Because this consciousness is shining every moment. Yeah? What is this, this consciousness right now shining and revealing and, and illumining? It's illumining thoughts, Vedantic thoughts, Vedantic conversations. This is what's being illumined, illumined by this Atima. You understand? And this Atima is shining. Is that by which this inquiry is possible? Is this consciousness shining in our intellect? You understand? Revealing. Vedantic thoughts, Vedantic inquiries, analysis, and so on. So Vedanta is only there is as an object serving the purpose to, to advertise the light of the illuminator. 
You understand? Mm. It's good advertisement. Mm Shall we go to Yani Yoga? Big picture. We, we're gonna move more or less fast because you know we are advanced students of Vedanta. So Yani Yoga. We analyze, we are looking before on the different yogas, huh? So <clears throat> the meditation yoga. Now, after looking into all other aspects, we went you know, in more details of different kinds of meditation. You know, uh, under the understanding that uh, meditation in Vedanta means contemplation on the teachings as presented by, by the scriptures. Yeah? So, and then everything concludes, yeah, Everything brings us to the final aspects of our sadhanas, which is yana yoga. Okay, all yogas. There is an expression that says, "All yogas leads to the self. All paths leads to Rome." Okay, and we say, "No, it's not really like that." One time I said, "All paths leads to the main road in which you go to Rome." Okay, so all paths do not take us to the knowledge of the self, self knowledge, but all paths are going to take us to the main gate, you know, by which we we take the road of yana yoga as the only path that can bring the individual to self knowledge and liberation. Okay, all other yogas are going to serve as preparatory yogas yeah? they are going to help us to, to refine, to purify, to develop certain qualifications, qualities, mental, emotional, intellectual qualities, so that we can go into the yana yoga, which is the <coughs> Upanishadic text, basically. So all other steps were preparatory in nature, Yani Yoga being the Upanishad is the essence of Vedanta. And we find some of the Yani Yoga in the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is, is a, a, how you say, a comprised version, version of the Vedas. You understand? The only thing missing on the Bhagavad Gita are the ritualistic aspects of the Vedas. But then you find karma, dharma there, and you find yana yoga, you know? It's a summary of the Vedas that somehow remove the ritualistic aspects of it, you know, and then presents everything. Karma, dharma, upasana, and yana yoga. That's why it's such a beautiful text. So all the other yogas are going to prepare for the yana yoga. With a growing introspection, the individual begins questioning the things they have been chasing in life, as we know. So the mind, when being too extroverted, it somehow wants things in the world, and then later on, it wants things in the spiritual world. That's what we, we call the spiritual samsara, the world of subtle objects of uh, of the spiritual world, you know, states of minds, certain epiphanies or certain expansions or incredible love that comes from a deep states of silence. So, or, or if you take ayahuasca or whatever, you know, you can experience certain states, you know, that, <clears throat> that they are, may be beautiful, but it still is samsara, okay? spiritual samsara. We go through the dense world of mundane 
objects and we move into the spiritual world of subtle objects and then come to a point and we say enough i do not want to be running for any subtle object even if it's a beautiful state of mind because now i have i have understood and converted my desire for experience into my into a desire to understand my limitless nature and then once we are clear about that and then we 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 take the paths of yoni yoga yeah if we have a strong vasana for other yogas it's not gonna hurt but it's important the individual know that the other yogas are intermediary yogas they are going to prepare the ground and once the ground is prepared it's not it's useless to be there re-preparing re-preparing the soil is already prepared right mark you being uh, 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 permaculture you know you you prepare the ground you don't need to be there again and again preparing the ground you just you know plant your seeds of yoni yoga and 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 harvest the fruits The inquirer begins to question whether they should really be seeking things that cause dependence or whether the ultimate goal. The instinctive urge of every living being is freedom. A bird can, can never be happy in a cage for all beings are driven by the desire to be free. You know, well, All beings are driven by the desire to be free. This is a very beautiful statement. And the human beings, although it seems we we live free, totally free now. I mean, we, there's nobody here living in any suppressed uh, uh, regime, you know, of uh, totalitarianism of China or anything in which you 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 have all your freedoms taken away from you. So we experience a certain degree of freedom, but we are not. Our inner freedom is compromised. Why? Because although we may may appear to be free to move around and to choose what to buy in the supermarket, we feel limited. We feel bound. We do not feel free. So this this freedom that we, <coughs> the Danta yeah, address is one's inner sense of freedom, which is compromised by what? By our desires for things, our desires for states. So every time we desire one thing, it's a statement that I don't have, therefore I need it to move with this nagging sense of limitation imposed by the fact that I don't have what I want. And then once the individual understands these mechanics and says, okay, if the problem is the wanting, Rather than trying to fulfill every wanting, I'm going to remove the wanting. Or I'm going to want only things that are easily available, like air. No, I don't want anything. I just, I only want air. You understand? And then we don't have any, any sense of limitation because I'm not limited by not having something. You understand? I only want to have air and I want to keep air. And, uh, and that's the only problem I have in life. And then Ishwara say, no problem. I will provide you with space and air. Huh? So and the limitation that we all experience is the limitation self, it's a self-imposed limitation that tells us, so you are not okay unless you have G's and G's and G's and G's. And the limitation many times is not only about having or gaining or accomplishing, but it is about how to keep it. As Krishna says in the Gita, I will take care of your getting and your keeping. Yeah? So we are busy self-inflicting this sense of limitation because we want things that we do not have and we want to keep things that we have, but we fear we will lose. So this makes us feel miserable limited okay <clears throat> not to say about the sense of limitation when we want to avoid or push or reject something that you know keeps coming back to you you know and uh it's it's another aspect it's a what we call a negative wanting you know i want to attract things i want to push things away so so the individual 
he's, he has a sense of, of dependence on objects because he's being operated by the, the body of vasanas, which are my likes and dislikes. Yeah? <clears throat> my, what I want, what I do not want, my desires and fears. And then we end up clinging to objects. Not because they love the object, but because he or she believes that he cannot be happy without these objects. Huh? I, have, I have a friend of mine that uh, she keeps saying that, uh, I mean, this will never come to her and nobody will ever know who she is because she does not understand English language to begin with. But uh, she, she wants to, to downsize and everything and, and, and come to live in nature, you know, not far from here and so on. And she made a big move in the past, bringing everything to, to here from Sao Paulo. And now, and few things, they sold everything there. Now they have a few things there. And the house that she rent around here cannot take anything anymore. And the lady, rather than selling the things that are going to be too many here, she spent more money on a transportation company to bring those items, you know? Because the person is like, okay, I mean, I have more than I need. I don't know what to do with all my things, my, my, but yet my attachment to these things that I do not need is such that I cannot believe to be happy without them. So I'm gonna take it with me, even though I may, I may not even know how I'm going to put it in the same, under the same roof, you understand? So we get attached to things. We, have a, we get attached to people. You know, we get attached to unhealth relationships many times. You know? And all of that is due to this fundamental ignorance, materialistic society. But the moment the person realizes that he can be just as happy without such a thing, he will give them up. This is because dependence on anything external binds us and limits our sense of freedom. And freedom is our nature, okay? And is our driving goal. We want to be free because our nature, this is an important point, our nature is freedom. We are not consciously aware that our nation is free, it's limitlessness, it's freedom. Consciousness is free because there is nothing other than itself. Therefore, there is no relationship and there is no chance to get attached to anything and develop vasana or desires and aversions to things. None of that applies to satya, to consciousness. So consciousness is our nature and it is absolutely free and independent yeah? but the person not not knowing it consciously but knowing it unconsciously goes about being operated by this fundamental avidya try to remove this sense of limitation which is not inherent to one's true nature you understand so that's why everybody is all the time trying to get rid of this sense of limitation and unfortunate, unfortunately, because these teachings, they are not available in the schools, we run, we waste time after time running out of ob after objects as a means to, to, to definitely, now once for all, remove this nagging sense of limitation. Why? Because my nature is limitlessness and I cannot be at easy with limitation. We are all at easy with that which is natural to us. If it is a nature, we never feel at ease. But unfortunately, we try to restore this limitlessness unconsciously by the means of running to gain and running to avoid the very objects that are being self-inflicted by our vasanas and making us feel limited. Okay, <clears throat> so freedom is our driving goal because it is our very nature and we do not feel at ease with things that are unnatural to us. Huh? As the seeker practices Kami Yoga and refines the mind and, and its personality, oh, how beautiful this word here, as the seeker 
practice Kami Yoga. I like I like when uh, when Swami Paramatananda presents this word personality. You understand? Because oh no, oh personality, no personality is the ego. It's false. No, the personality needs to be refined. Hmm? It needs to be purified. It needs to develop good mental attitudes. Yeah? good patterns of thinking and, and, and responding, you know, wisdom, the personality needs to be purified, refined, definitely. So the seeker practice Kami Yoga, understands Dharma Yoga, in the process refines the mind and refines the personality, it becomes a wise person. Oh, but the person is not real, yes, but the knowledge is going to happen to the person. And the person needs to be refined until it can reject itself and you know claim and accept, embrace its true identity as consciousness, as awareness. And he or she develops a clear vision and realizes that dependence on external factors is what causes bondage and and makes us feel limited, which is not natural to us. What all people really seek, whether they know it or not, is freedom or moksha. Everybody is looking for freedom. Everybody is looking for freedom. And people do not know that the way to look for freedom is only possible by the means of yana, understanding your true limitless nature, because you cannot accomplish, gain, or obtain something that it's already yours. Yeah? We can only understand it, okay? <clears throat> Everybody's looking for freedom, but they don't understand that they are freedom itself. They only need to understand, oh, I'm already free. Like in those old days with Papaji, people would go in front of Papaji and then have a nice epiphany and they would say, oh, Papaji, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. You know? And then the people would walk out of the satsang believing that the body mind are free. They would never really understand that they are free as consciousness, you know, not as the body mind complex. I was there. I can say what I say because I was there. Not, not to say that none of that had a spiritual value, it definitely did, you know, but it was also a lot of incomplete, you know, transmission of knowledge. Until now, by practicing Kami Yoga, Upasana, the seeker has been preparing the mind, as we know. Now comes the question, how to actually gain this freedom? Huh? And as we know, it's only possible by the means of yana. And even Ramana Maharaj made that beautiful, bold statement, you know, towards the end of his life when he said, by knowledge and knowledge alone, the self can be realized. Moksha is not about becoming, self-knowledge is not about becoming something other than we are. The problem is simply one of ignorance, ignorance of our nature. According to Vedanta, this ignorance does not die a natural death. This is important to understand. This ignorance is beginningless, is hardwired, it's very profound. It's, it is the fabric of media, you understand? So to kill this ignorance requires a lot of spiritual effort. Oh, but Ramana Maharaj got it without any effort. Well, we have no clue how much effort he may have done in previous verse, you understand? So it does not die a natural death. It needs to be killed. Uh, the scriptures say, anything else in the world is born and die. This ignorance was never born. It's what caused the universe. It would cause the jiva. Yeah? And furthermore, 
it cannot die a natural death. The only way to kill it is by the sword of self-knowledge. Only the sword of knowledge will kill it in a very gentle and beautiful way without hurting the Jiva Atma, but, but purifying the Jiva Atma in the process. There is no need to be afraid and caring. There's ignorance because what? We are not ignorance. The video belongs to Mayashwara. Our nature is awareness, consciousness. Understand? And the Jiva Atma is going to be purified by this sword that's going to remove, cancel, neutralize this ignorance. As one progresses with the Yana Yoga, grace is earned and help arrives from the outside. And help arrive from the outside. When the student is read, the teacher will appear, as we all know. The Danta is one single package. It takes time for most people to understand that, that the teacher is someone that appears in one's life and it was put there by Ishwar. And the teacher is required because alone we have a hard time to, to really do this self study, you know. <clears throat> Not that it is impossible, but it requires someone to be highly, highly, highly qualified. Huh? Seeking with sin. A, a mind once purified by the practice of Kami Yoga and Vipassana Yoga is ready to hear the truth. The first thing Vedanta teaches is that true security and happiness can never be attained outside of oneself. Any mature, honest person will already have found this to be true in their experience. But guess what? It's very rare to find a mature individual in the world. You understand? Any mature individual is going to figure out that the world does not solve the human drama, the human problem, no matter, because some people, they are very successful in the world and they are very rich they have everything in terms of security and, and, and status and material banks, uh, <coughs> material assets, and, and so on. You know, all pleasures available. And we see a lot of them even committing suicidal because they are totally unhappy. Huh? So anybody with common sense, you know, which is not very common nowadays in society. Anybody with maturity, which is hard to find, would come to this conclusion, even without Vedanta, that the world does not really do the job. Success, like Osho Rajneesh once said, I never forgot that, nothing fails more than success. You know, <clears throat> why? Because once you have success in the world, and then you see that, in spite of all my success, I'm still feeling miserable. And then that becomes the biggest failure possible, the biggest delusion, deception, you know? Some people, they become even depressed when they see that after have accomplished so much, they are still miserable. <clears throat> Anything that is gained will be lost, as we know. There is no lasting happiness in anything of the world. Once we have accepted this fact, Vedanta tells us that the security and happiness can never be found in the world because they are the very essence of who we are. It is our very nature. Why Vedanta says that the self is of the nature of security and happiness? This is a good advertisement because the self is beyond security and insecurity, is beyond pleasure and pain. But the nature of the self being limitlessness, it somehow reflects in the human experience as a sense of security and happiness. Why security? Because understanding my true nature, I know for sure that fire is never going to burn me. You know, water cannot really wet me. Well, bullets cannot kill me. Air cannot kill me by dehydration, dehydration and so on. So you understand my true nature is the only safe 
safety there is because nothing can affect me, nothing can really touch me as consciousness. Time is not going to consume what I really am. It will consume this body, but it will not consume my awareness, my consciousness, my soul, my, my real soul. Yeah? <clears throat> so once we, we know that, and then we say, scripture says to motivate all us, oh, you, you want to secure it? Okay. Guess what? You are only going to find security in yourself. And then people start looking for security inside of the body. No. You're going to gain security by shifting your identity from the body mind, which is totally fragile, which is totally vulnerable. You shift your identity from the body mind to consciousness, and then you're going to be positioned on your true nature, which is absolutely untouched by anything that may happen in meteor. Therefore, the scriptures say, your nature, the nature of the self is security and joy. And why joy? Because the misery we have in the, in, in the world is due to this identification with the body mind that is, is limited by time and it's limited by several other means. And moreover, it's limited by its own desires and aversions that cause this sense of limitation and misery because we can't always get what we want. Like the Rolling Stones used to say, we can't get it. And then again and again, we experience what? The opposite of joy, the opposite of happiness because we have linked our happiness to certain gains or accomplishments. No? So the scriptures say it's of the nature of securing. The, the, the Viveka Shudamani begins, the first verse is the nature of the self is security and joy. You know, it's not that the self is, like, is the experience security and joy. The self is beyond the pair of the opposites you know, that emerge in media. But the Jiva Atma wants it to understand my true nature in its human experience as a jiva with knowledge uh, in respect to its true nature, it experiences a sense of security and satisfaction because he, although in spite of the meat, although it living, lives in meat, interacting with this, this order of, of duality, but yet aware of its true nature as the limitless, you know, safe that's uh, that that somehow leaks i tend to say that the knowledge of satya leaks into mitya and then the jiva atma can i can appreciate and enjoy the aspects of its nature as satya in the mitya you understand is this knowledge is the only way we can experience a certain degree of security and joy and happiness even even if uh, a lot of pain may come to the body-mind complex. What is within us we can never find outside. Again, those are concessions. This is an introductory book and it says that the self is inside of us but we know that the self is pervading the body and the mind and the entire universe. Huh? What is inside of us will never be found outside. It's true. It's not in the object. It is in yana that we're going to find security and satisfaction. If I forgot, if I forget I have a key in my pocket, doesn't matter how far and wide I search, I will never be able to find it anywhere. My failure to find it is not due to any lack of effort on my side. Every samsara is making huge effort to find freedom, huge effort to try to find, you know, satisfaction and security. Yeah? But it's wasted. Why? Because they are trying to gain that in a place, you know, <laughs> that uh, does not really provide limitlessness, security, and, and and satisfaction. The search is misplaced. The search is placed on objects as Vedanta presents to us. We have the subject and the object. If we run, we look for trying to find a solution for this human condition, 
in objects, we are going to fail. And then we say, okay, you have to understand the subject. You understand? And know that you are the subject. And then the first thing that the Jiva has to deal is to define, properly define the subject. Because the subject in the beginning appears as the intellect. Oh, yes, I'm the subject because everything is appearing, you know, within my intellect. You know, so I'm the subject and the art is an object. And then Vedanta takes us to a subtler level of discrimination, which even the object becomes, even the intellect becomes an object. You understand? And that is when we start going to the deeper waters of Vedanta. Since independence is my nature, dependence is uncomfortable to me. If it was the other way around and, and dependence was my nature, I would feel comfortable being limited, dependent, and miserable. But that's not the case, as we know. We never feel at ease with those human experiences. Whatever, let me see. Let me, I want to see if I conclude. Whatever is a nature to us makes us feel uncomfortable, as we, as we have determined. The moment the body has to deal with something that is not natural, so our system, all our virus, coronavirus and so on, for instance, is going to feel uncomfortable and is going to try to develop antibodies, you know, to fight it and to, to get rid of anything which is not natural. It's not nature because it's breaking the natural balance of the body, it's bringing about disease. We struggle, the body in its own intelligence is going to feel like trying to eject that foreign body. Therefore, they struggle to get rid of anything that is unnatural, unnatural to us is natural. Yeah? One of the pranas does that purpose. It's all the time try to get rid of what is not natural to our system. As dependence is nature to us, we naturally strive for independence. Everybody's trying to find one's freedom, one's independence. The scriptures point out that our nature is freedom. Due to ignorance, we have disowned our own nature and taken ourselves for granted. We believe that our nature is the body-mind. We think that is the ultimate truth. And then due to this mistaken, yeah, this, <clears throat> this, uh, mistakenly uh, identification, you know, we suffer. So just this other paragraph, human beings have studied and cataloged just about everything in the perceivable universe. Science is trying to understand the universe. We have studied all different plants, animals, the, the mineral world, the fish, the sea uh, life, Rivers, mountains, we do everything, even out there in the galaxies. We live in an age of information and knowledge, all readily accessible through Google. But how many have inquired into the most base, basic questions, which is what is this true I? Yeah. Have you heard me? Arlindo, you're breaking up a lot. Just a moment. No, I, missed that I, whole bit. I just know what's happening here. Just one second. Okay, I know, I know what's going on. So we were saying without uh, we live in an age of information. Knowledge is something that we everybody's crazy about. We want to get knowledge in the micro and the macro. Science is all over the place. Now we have artificial intelligence. We have all this knowledge available to us, but nobody bothers to inquire into the most fundamental question, which is what is my real nature? Who am I? What is this I? What is this? 
Right. Without knowledge of who we truly are, we have concluded that we are miserable conglomerations of body and mind limit and entirely dependent on the world for our satisfaction and happiness. This is samsara. The belief that the world of objects, they can provide us with true value, true happiness, limitlessness, and satisfaction. Vedanta tells us that to achieve moksha, what we require is self-knowledge. This is, is not a knowledge about the objects or the things, or even psychological knowledge. A lot of people <coughs> confuse a little bit the, the psychological understanding of the, of the body, the, the mental emotional uh, construct of the subtle body. They think that this self-knowledge, and this is knowledge in respect, you know, knowledge of phenomena, yeah? not self-knowledge. Knowledge is, self-knowledge is our true nature. The student who was still, until now, a seeker of freedom, now becomes a seeker of knowledge. And here there is a, a, a small distinction. The student who was still, until now, a seeker of freedom, a mumukshu, now becomes a seeker of self-knowledge, which is uh, which is a, a satoshi presented by, by the tradition here and there, and Swami Paramartananda presents this satoshi. But as long as we are looking freedom without understanding that we are freedom, and all we need to know is understanding our nature as freedom, we are mumukshu, and that mumukshu has to be converted into jinyanusu which is someone who believes, trust the scripture and say, I am already free. I just need to fully understand and claim it. The seeker now knows that the problem is ignorance of one's true nature. And such ignorance can only be dispelled by the means of self-knowledge, of knowledge altogether. Huh? Okay, so this is the introduction of the Yoga next time if we come back to, the, how did you guys find about this text? It's, it's, not, it's not bad to revisit this concept. Huh? What do you think? Hmm? Yes, I think, it's, I think it's good to revisit it. And it's good that it is a simple book because if we had two complex books going, that would be way too much. So yeah. I think this gives us something to fall back on when there's no... I think it's a good give gives us a, a good balance, right, Lynn? How, what do you think, Ruth? Yeah, yeah. Okie dokie. So we meet again next Monday. We go back to our Panchadas. And uh, thank you again. So I, I'm happy that the Sangha is still holding together on Thursdays. Om Puh Namada Puh Namidam Puh Na Puh Namudachate Puh Na Sya Puh Namadaya Puh Name Vavashishate Om Shanti 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, my friends. We meet again. Arrivederci. Love you. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao. Thanks. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mark. Goodbye, everyone.